I am 25 years old, so it's my last year to be in the passion age bracket. And I have to tell you, I came here so excited and expectant for what God was gonna do in my life has personally been so moved and so challenged and so changed by this. And so I might be up here uh, getting to share a message, but I'm right there with you. I've been convicted. I've had uh, tears and moments of just my yes, Lord. I was standing too last night. Yes, Lord, I wanna live my life for you, God. I wanna endure whatever it takes. And so I'm just so grateful to be in this space alongside of y'all and learning with y'all. But I'm so grateful to be at Passion. You know what I'm so grateful for? The passion's amazing, right? Passion's pretty incredible. We got a whoop whoop up here. I love my woo people. I'm a woo girl. Passion's amazing. But the amazing thing about passion is that it's not passion that makes it so amazing. The amazing thing about this conference is not the lights, it's not the music, it's not the people, it's not any of that. It's the presence of God. The amazing thing about passion is that we come together and we acknowledge and we stand in awe of the presence of God. That's the amazing thing about passion. And so the really cool thing is, is that after passion conference today, the power behind passion doesn't get put in a box and comes out next year when we get in the bins. The power of passion walks out of the room with you because the power of passion being the spirit of God is living inside of you. And I think sometimes we get into this kind of Old Testament mindset thinking that we have to show up to a place and that's where the presence of God is gonna be. And in the Old Testament, that was true. You would have to show up to the temple and this is where the presence of God was gonna be. But in most case scenarios, you couldn't just show up to the temple because you can't stand before a holy God unless you are amongst the holy of holiest people. You would have to do all the rituals, all the things, and then you could go into the temple. But praise God, John 3, 16, that he loved us so much that he sent his son to us so that we can be in relationship with him because of the blood of Christ. But then it gets even better. When Jesus was here, he goes, hey, I'm gonna leave. And the disciples are so sad about that. He's like, but don't worry, it's gonna get better because we're gonna send our spirit to be with you. And so how cool is that, that not only did Jesus come and it got super personal, but got even more personal, that we actually get to carry the presence of God everywhere we go. That the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive inside of you. Now, why am I so fired up about that this early in the morning? Because that should get everybody fired up this early in the morning. Because if that's true, if that's true, that should change everything about the way we live. If it's true that the Spirit of God is living inside of us, then we should have passion moments in the grocery store. Then we should have passion moments every single place we go. Then revival really should happen. I mean, we we, we say all the time, we want revival to happen. God, bring revival. And I just wonder, you know, why, why isn't it happening? I don't think it's because God's not doing his job. I think it's because we're not responding to ours. I think it's because we haven't realized and had the revelation of the fact that the Spirit of God is inside of us. And so everywhere we go can be a place of miracles. Everywhere we go is a moment to share the good news. But I think in order for that to happen, it's got to become personal to you. It's got to really become personal. So my talk today is going to be about what it looks like when it gets personal with Jesus. And we're gonna start in Luke 5. We're gonna talk about Peter today, Simon Peter. Y'all, if you're tracking with my passion messages, I have talked about Simon Peter every single time. And JP uh, called out Peter for, you know, being a little extra, and I don't know what that says about me, that I always choose to talk about Peter. But I just relate to him so much, I learned so much from his life. And we're going all the way back to the very beginning of his relationship with Jesus. Most of this text refers to him as Simon. It's before Jesus changed his name to Peter. And so Simon, Peter, same person. If you get confused, the story goes like this in verse one of chapter five. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the boat. 
So I love what's happening here. Basically, just to paint the picture what's happening, Jesus shows up to preach by the lake. He's about to give a word, but the crowd is pressing in. I mean, there are so many people here. So he's looking around and he sees a boat and he's like, hey, can I get in your boat and can we go out a little bit? That way we can get away from the crowd so we have more space. So he gets in Simon Peter's boat, gets out a little bit to preach the word. So if that was happening today, let's just put it into modern time. Let's say today, instead of me preaching, Jesus is preaching. So it's 10,000 times more cool. Let's go 10 million times more cool. So many more people are showing up because Jesus is here to preach. The crowds are pressing in. We can't fit in State Farm, but he wants everybody to be there. So he's looking around and he's like, do any of you drive a truck? You do? Girl, that's right, okay, yeah, girl. So he's like, hey, is it cool if I go get in your truck. You can drive me out a little bit. Is that cool with you? You'll drive me out. Let's just all go out into the parking lot. That way we can fit more people. Everybody can be there. We can just, you know, go miles and miles away. And so you're like, this is great. Jesus gets in your truck. You drive him out. He's like, I'll just preach from the bed of it. That's cool with you. Cool, great. Okay, awesome. So he gets in the back of the truck and then, you know, you get out and sit in the bed of the truck with him. And he just stands up and starts preaching to all these people. And everybody's just sitting there receiving the word and it's just a cool thing, Jesus is preaching. But the whole time you're sitting there and you're like, Jesus is in my truck. Like, this is crazy, he's in my truck. And I don't know what Peter was thinking this day, but I just feel like I would be thinking, Jesus is in my boat. Like, he's in my boat, he's in my space. Jesus is in my truck, like how crazy is this? Like, this is my truck, like this is my everyday place. Like. This is where I jam out to music. This is where I call my mom. This is where I go through Chick-fil-A. Like, this is just my space. And now Jesus is in my truck. And not only is he in my truck, but he's doing what he does. He's preaching and lives are changing. And how crazy is this that he's in my truck doing all this? And I think it was so intentional this day that Jesus got into Peter's boat because later he was gonna call Simon Peter to start the church, and I think right here he's showing him what it looks like to start a church. You preach from your boat. And I think so many of us, we don't even think about that being a place to preach from. We don't even think about our truck being a space of ministry, our boat, our house, our apartment, our classes, like our family, that place, no. No, 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 church is the place for that. Our small group's the place for that, passion's the place for that. Not my truck, not my boat, but I just want us to wake up to the idea that your truck, your finance class, your walks to school with your friends, your apartment, that is the place ministry should be happening the most. Why? Because you're there. How? Because the spirit of the God, God is living inside of you. And so I think so many times we don't even put those two things together because a lot of us, we compartmentalize our personal life and our spiritual life. We have places where our spiritual life takes place and then we have places where our personal life takes place. And those two things don't really merge a lot of the times. But I think we have to get it out of our head that those two things are two different things and they have to become one thing. That of course he would preach from the boat. Of course he would preach from the truck. Of course, God, because wherever I am is a place for ministry to happen. So many people say, Sadie, I wanna do ministry. How do I start doing ministry? And I always say very simply, friend, you just start doing ministry because ministry is not waiting for you on a platform. And ministry is not a job position or a title. Ministry is who you are and it's where you are and it's what you do, no matter who you are or where you are, or what you do, because you are a disciple of Christ. Ministry is a full-time thing. Ministry is not a separate thing from everything else. You can preach from the boat. I love what happens next, verse four. It says, and when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let your net down for a catch. Now I just think this is so cool. Jesus gets done preaching, and then he wants to go fishing. He's like, yeah, I just spoke this super great word and lives are changing, now let's go fishing. And I think that that is just so cool because I think many of us, we can't even imagine what that would look like. We would never think Jesus, you know, would be preaching in the truck and then he'd be like, do you wanna go play basketball? 
You're like, what? You want to play basketball? You want to fish? Because we only see him in the spiritual moments and we don't see him in the personal moments. But I don't think Jesus just wants to preach to you. I think he wants to fish with you. I don't think he just wants to be in the spiritual moments. I think he wants to be in all of the moments. But so many of us, those two things are different. Those two things are not the same. This is my spiritual. This is my personal. And if we're really honest with self, we see it all the time. If you look on Instagram, we put our bio and we have this, you know, Bible verse, but then our feed looks nothing like it. Those two things are different. We have our spiritual life and we have our personal life. But no, no, no. It shouldn't contradict each other. It should be one and the same. Let's do it like this. Let's have a passion moment. See, in these gatherings, I love what has happened. It's happened a few times when we're here. If, if we can um, turn the lights off, let's have a, passion, a good old passion moment. If I turn my light on, what's everybody doing? Let's go, light it up. Now just keep your lights on for a minute. Everybody look around. This is beautiful. This is what it looks like to burn again for Jesus. This is a representation of our spiritual lives. This is what it looks like to be the light of the world. We're in a dark room, but our eyes are gravitated towards the light, right? Beautiful. Now what happens is when we're at Passion, we all have our lights and they're shining bright and we're excited to shine them and it's so fun and it's so awesome and it's so powerful. But what happens is a lot of times when we leave Passion, something happens. And we're gonna do it like this. On the count of three, I'm gonna want everyone to swipe left to your selfie cam. Ready? One, two, three. And something happened to the light. You see, because it's a weird thing. The iPhone, by design, you cannot be shining the light and looking at the camera at the same time. For some reason, by design, you cannot be shining the light and looking at yourself. For some reason, you cannot be trying to get the glory and give the glory by design of the iPhone. But guess what? You also are designed in such a way that you are called to be the light of the world. That no matter where you are, no matter where you go, the light doesn't turn off. It doesn't matter what room you put me in. It doesn't matter what space you put me in. It doesn't matter how dark the room is getting. I cannot separate my spiritual life and my personal life. I cannot separate the light of Jesus within me and the world around me. Jesus is all of me. So if I'm in the room, the light will be shining. You can turn the lights on. It's such a good visual of what it looks like. When we're in this space and everything's shining, we're so bright and on fire for God and then we walk into this room and then our life is all about us. Friend, no matter where you are, your life needs to be all about King Jesus. But here's the thing, here's the thing. It's very easy for everybody to shine their light in this room. It's very easy to shine your light when I'm shining my light and they're shining their light and we're all together shining our light and it's dark in here so it's even better when we're all shining our light because it looks even better and cooler and brighter and it's just awesome. But it's a lot more awkward when you're out in the world by yourself. Let's be real, if I was up here this whole time and I'm walking around and my phone's in my pocket and y'all all saw that my flashlight was on, y'all would all be like, that is so awkward. Somebody tell her to turn her light off. That is not supposed to be happening right now. And I just like not even know when the light's on, everybody's distracted. Because so many of us have, ha that's happened to us, right? It's in your pocket and someone's like, hey girl, start your lights on. Can you turn it off real fast? You're like, oh shoot, that's embarrassing, yeah, sorry. Or it's in your purse and someone's like, hey, before we finish this conversation, your light's on. And you're like, oh well, man, sorry, that's so weird, turn it off. And I think a lot of times that's actually kind of how it feels like whenever you shine your light in places that a light's not really normally shown in. I think sometimes, you know, when you shine your light in a place where it's out of context for a light to be shining, it feels awkward. It might be distracting. Someone might call you out for it. And that's more like the way it's gonna feel when you shine your light outside of these walls. See, in here, when you shine your light, everybody cheers, everybody screams, everybody's excited because we're all called to be the light of the world and we're all responding to that call. 
But when you're actually out in the world and you go back to your college campus and you're shining your light on your college campus, people are going to begin to notice because it will stick out and it will look different. And someone even might say to you, what are you doing? Your light's on. We don't, we don't do that here. We don't shine our light in this space. We don't talk like that here. Or you go back and like Louis said, you're Eddie. What happened to Eddie? Eddie's shining his light. And he's not going out anymore on the weekends and he decides not to drink anymore and he might even break up with his girlfriend because they don't have a very godly relationship. And you're like, why are you shining your light? <laughs> We're not at passion anymore. We don't shine our light. Like, you don't have to do that here. It's cool. Like, that's, this is just not the place we do that. But we'll all go to passion next year. We can do that again, but not here. And here's the thing. It, it might feel awkward. And it might draw attention. But it's supposed to. You're called to be the light of the world. You're called to be the light in the dark spaces. If it causes attention, let it be. If it leads people to ask questions, even better, answer them. If it causes people to feel uncomfortable, sit with them, talk them through, hey, listen, it, it, I can't believe this either. But it's the, it's the spirit of God that changed my life. It's the cross that's changed everything. It's the reason why I'm shining this light. Let it be a conversation starter. It might feel foreign, but Paul said we are foreigners. So it will feel like that. It definitely might feel like that. But when you start shining your light in those places, man, you have no idea the darkness you can expose. You have no idea the lives that you can change. You have no idea the people on your campus that need and are so desperate for you to awkwardly own your light because they are starving for someone to speak truth in their life. So don't let the feeling of it being awkward stop you. We aren't a people that are supposed to submit to our feelings. Next verse, it's so good, I love this so much. It says in response to him saying, let down your net for a catch. It says, and Simon answered, master, we toiled all night and took nothing. And I love this so much. I want y'all all to underline this or circle it real big. It says, but at your word, I will let down the net. Now this is so powerful because it was actually so humble what Simon Peter did in this moment. You see, because Jesus is coming and he just preached and now he's wanting to fish and Simon is a fisherman who already washed his nets and had been up all night trying to catch something and he was not catching anything. And so it would have been really easy for Simon to basically say anything other than but at your word, I will let down the net. Simon could have said so many other things to Jesus in this moment. Like a couple of things he could have said is he could have been like, Jesus, uh, look, man, we toiled all night. We haven't caught anything. He could have left it that. He said, I just washed my net. We're kind of done with this. And he definitely could have said something else that I think many of us might have said. He could have been like, look, Jesus, here's the thing. You're a great carpenter and you're a great teacher of God's word. You just spoke a great word, but I'm a fisherman. I fish in these waters, this is my boat. I know the nature of this water. I know the fish are not biting today. So let's just go on back and just do what we always do. We'll come later another time, but it's just not happening right now. He could have very easily said that, but he didn't say that. He said, but at your word, I will let down the net. But I think so many of us, instead of saying that, at your word, I will change my plans. At your word, I wanna do whatever you say, Lord. We start to say things like, God, you're good at being God. You're a great God. You're good at being God. But this is my thing. I got this side of my life. You're great at being God, but you didn't go to college. Like, you don't understand what it looks like to be in college these days. This is my major. This is what I worked so hard for. You're gonna be a God, and I hear you saying, maybe I should pivot, maybe I should do something else. But no, 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 you don't understand. This is what I worked so hard for. You don't understand what it's like to try to have a social life and try to be cool on campus, but also try to keep up with the grades and all this stuff. So you can't really speak into my college life, God, because you don't really understand that part. But God, you're good, and you're king of the world and everything. But no, 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 this is my college life. God, you're good, and you're be good at being God. Yeah, all of those things are true, but God, you don't understand social media. You didn't have social media. Like I'm trying to be an influencer. I'm trying to build a platform. I'm not gonna share my faith on Instagram, but you're gonna be in God and I love you, but you can't speak into my social media life. 
God, you're good at being God. You are God, you are king of the world, but you seemed okay with being single. I'm trying to get a boyfriend. I want a girlfriend. Like, you can't speak into this side of my life. You don't know what it takes in these days to be in a relationship and all that stuff. You're gonna be in God, but this is my life. This is my thing. This is my personal life. Yeah, you're gonna be in God, but I got this. I got this under the control. But let me ask you, do you really have it under control? How's that working out? That dude said, absolutely not. <laughs> And if we were all being honest, we'd probably all go, no, we don't. We don't have it under control. And you're letting God be a part of your life, but he wants to be a part of all of your life. He doesn't just wanna be God over your spiritual life. He wants to be Lord over all of your life. And here's the thing, how foolish would it have been for Peter to say, no, you don't understand, like I've been up all night, I know this water. You think you know the water better than the one who made the water? You think you know the fish more than the one who made the fish? You really think you know more about the college life because he didn't go to college, more about social media, more about a relationship when he knit you together in your mother's womb? No way, no way. God, I need you to be Lord of my life. God, I need you to be Lord of my life. Forget my plan. Forget whatever direction I thought was best. You know what's best, because you are what's best. So many of us, we, we, he's Lord of some, but not all. He's gotta get to the point where he's Lord of all. I have this friend, and um, we went through this a couple years ago. It's just kind of a silly situation. But not really, it just kind of sounds funny, but it's true and I think it's actually accurate for a lot of us and how we live our life. And I could say I've been in this boat at times in my life. But basically, you know, we had this big friend group and we all had a time in our life where we got to live together and it was so fun, and it was just so great. But then, you know, after you get past your early 20s, after college stuff, you go your different directions. I got married, having kids, other of our friends got married, having kids, different career paths. We're all kind of in different spaces and places now. But every now and then we'll get to come together on trips and stuff and catch up and just see how each other's doing and it's so fun. But this has actually happened on two different occasions, two different trips that we've been on back in the day. And it was just so interesting where as we were all catching up, she would catch up with some of my other friends and she was giving them very different updates than she was giving me. So what would happen is when we'd be in little conversations with each other, she'd be telling one of my friends, you know, all about the juice in her life, all the tea, if you will. She was basically telling her about how her and her boyfriend started living together, and that's been crazy, and all the different things and dynamics that go with that. And she was talking about how her and her friends have been going out to the club each weekend, and it's just kind of gotten out of control, and she's been getting drunk a lot, her friends have been getting drunk a lot, so-and-so doesn't talk to so-and-so. And she wasn't saying these things like it was a bad thing, she was just giving them the reality of her situation. And so she's catching up, telling them all about her life and all this stuff. And I wasn't in the room for, for that moment. But when I was in the room, and I'd say, how have you been? What's new in your life? She would tell me a completely different story. She would tell me what devotional book her and her boyfriend are going through. And she would talk to me about passion. What are you, what are you preaching on this year? Did you hear the latest message from so-and-so? Oh, did you see Christine Kane's last Instagram post? And it would just be every spiritual thing about her life. And that would be the update that she would give me. And later, months later, my friends told me, you know, she's been going through craziness. I didn't even know. She, and they're telling me all this stuff that she's kind of been walking through. And I knew nothing about that because I didn't know anything about her personal life. I just knew about her spiritual life. But whenever I heard what she was actually going through, it broke my heart because what I realized that day when I found out about all the stuff she was going through was that it didn't make me love her any less. Not at all. I wasn't judging her, I didn't love her any less because she was participating in those things, but what it did do is it actually prohibited us from having any type of real relationship because I wasn't invited in to speak into that part of her life. I knew about her spiritual life, but I wasn't invited in to intervene in her personal life. 
And the next time I saw her, she did the very same thing, not knowing that I knew everything about her personal life at this point, she's giving me all the spiritual updates and still I cannot speak into the personal things because she hasn't opened her heart to receive anything from that from me. She just wants me to talk about the spiritual stuff, not about the personal stuff. And I think so many times we do that in our conversations with Jesus. We come to the Lord, the King of Kings, who knows everything about our story, and we act like he knows nothing about our personal life, and we just give him all of our spiritual life, and we talk in the spiritual language, and we craft everything perfectly, and you know we worship with our hands raised and all this stuff, but that looks nothing like the rest of our life. And it's not that he doesn't love you, and he, he doesn't love you any less. It's not that he's sitting there like so judgmental of you, no, not at all. He loves you so much. But you got to invite him into that personal side of your life because many of you, you're like, why, why is this not working? Why is my spiritual life and my personal life not connecting? Why am I trying to build this relationship with God? I'm talking to them all the time and there's nothing happening. It's because you're not really inviting him into your life. It's because, yeah, you're, you're in communication with him, but you're not in relationship with him. Yes, you're, you're talking to him. Yes, you're raising your hands in worship. But as Jackie said, but is the spirit of God on your life? Is there any fruit to that? Well, maybe it's because you're not inviting him into all of that. You see, many of you talked about this a minute ago with the light thing. To some of you, you're just gonna have to get past the awkwardness of shining your light in dark places. But to some of you, it's going to require something more. Because to some of you, it's not just that it's awkward to shine your light. It's not just that your personal life and your spiritual life, you know, you compartmentalize them because it's awkward, or you compartmentalize them because you've really just never even thought about bringing your spiritual life into your personal life. But to some of you, the reason why this message is a really big deal is because it's not just that they're compartmentalized, it's because your personal life is actually contradicting your spiritual life. They're in direct opposition of each other, and you know in order for your personal life to become your spiritual life, everything has to change. Repentance has to happen. You know, just like my friend, it's gonna require a conversation. It's gonna require an invitation. God, I'm gonna let you into this part of my life, and it's not pretty. I want you to intervene, God. I don't, I don't actually want this anymore, but I don't know how I'm gonna stop doing it anymore. But the great news about God is you don't have to get perfect to come to him. Absolutely not. He meets you in your brokenness. That's the power of the cross, that while you were still a sinner, he died for you. I love the story of the prodigal son. Jesus gave us such a beautiful picture that this son kind of ran away and he's squandering all his living. And you know, the father, he didn't go with him to squander his living, but the father loved him the whole time. He loved him, broke his heart, that his son was gone. But the minute that the son came back in his direction, not only did he open the door and welcome him back, but he ran after him hugged him, embraced him, celebrated his return, and walked back home with him. The son didn't have to even bear the shame of knocking on the door. No, the father met him with a hug and a kiss. The son thought he would just be a servant at this point, but the father was like, no, you're still my son. Some of you today, your spiritual life and personal life might be contradicting each other up to this point, and maybe you're afraid to fully surrender and fully ask for repentance because you're scared you're gonna go back to it. But the worst thing for you to do would be to try to go back to it alone. The best thing you can do is say, Jesus, I need you to be a part of this side of my life because I don't have the power to break the addiction in my own strength. I need your spirit. I love what happens as this story goes on. After Peter kind of has this surrender moment of letting down his net and trusting Jesus with his life, abundance began to come into his life. And then it led, all these things led to just a heart of repentance. 
The story goes on and it says, when they had done this, they enclosed such a large number of fish that their nets were breaking. See, because when you come back to Jesus, even though you might have been empty last night, you're completely filled today. They signaled to their partners and the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. I mean, we're talking so many fish. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at his knees saying, depart from me for I am a sinful man, Lord. See, when things start to get personal with Jesus, I think repentance is just a natural response. And many of you, it's starting to get so personal, it feels uncomfortable, but let yourself go to that place. Peter couldn't even help it. I mean, they're fishing. This isn't like a spiritual moment or this is like a very personal moment, but he's like, depart from me, I'm, I'm a sinful man because all of a sudden he's realizing that he is God. But what I love about this is that this actually wasn't the first time that Peter encountered Jesus. This wasn't like the first time that he ever saw Jesus or anything. Actually in the very chapter before, in chapter four, it's so crazy, it says that Jesus was preaching in the synagogue and he left the synagogue and he went to Simon Peter's house. And when he got to Simon Peter's house, he saw that his mother-in-law was sick with a high fever. And Jesus just completely rebukes the fever and the fever leaves and he heals his mother-in-law. And then not only does he just heal the mother-in-law, but the town starts to bring every sick person to Jesus and Jesus just begins to heal all of them. He's casting out demons. And Simon Peter was there for the whole thing. And then in the next chapter, the start of it, we read that Jesus gets into his boat and preaches an entire message to all these people in this boat. But what's crazy to me is that it wasn't the miraculous healings that Peter saw that made him fall to his knees and say, you are the Lord. And it wasn't the word that he heard spoken to everybody else that made him fall to his knees and say, you are the Lord. I'm a sinful man, it wasn't either of those encounters, it was the fishing moment. And you say, what? How was it not the miraculous moment? How was it not the word? How was it the moment with the fish? I think it was the moment with the fish because that was what was so personal to Peter. And when Jesus showed up in such a personal way and said, look at who I am even over this situation that might seem small to everybody else, but this is huge for you. And I think the reason why it's not clicking for some of us is because we are trying to live off the faith of everyone else around us. We're looking at what everybody else is experiencing and we're saying, okay, I can get behind that. Okay, well, they were healed and they're delivered and well, I'm, I'm worshiping too and that word was for them and that's cool and God, okay. But the reason why it hasn't led you to repentance is because you haven't personally invited him in to your space. Because you haven't fished with him. You haven't walked to school with him. You haven't woken up in the morning and just said, good morning, God. And I just challenge you, don't leave here today not making it personal not making your spiritual life become all of your life. Not making that moment where you say, God, you are God and I'm not, I'm a sinful man, but I love the Lord. He doesn't push him away in that moment when he recognizes the sin, no, he draws him in, but it's so cool right before that it says, for he and all of who were there were astonished at the catch of fish that were taken and who were also there were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon which this is so cool because James and John were there too. So this is Peter, James, and John's moment with Jesus where they're all like astonished at who God is. They can't believe who they're falling on their knees before him. This is right before they follow him. And Peter, James, and John are not like three small characters in the Bible. They're like people that we read books about. They're people who inspire us. They're people who we wanna live our lives like because they're people who started the church. And it was on that day in this boat that all of them began to follow Jesus. Because here's what happens. When you invite Jesus onto your boat, when you invite Jesus into your personal space, not only does it revive you, but it revives all of those around you. Not only does it make a difference in your life, it makes a difference in everybody's lives around you because people will see, wait a second, you fished all night last night and you didn't catch anything, but yet today your boat is sinking full of fish. 
Wait a second, you used to be the girl that had so much anxiety, we didn't even see you, and yet today you're jumping for joy and confidence in the Lord. How did that happen? It happened because of Jesus. Wait, you used to be like crazy. You used to be the wildest person on campus and now you're preaching? Because of Jesus. You want people to see that light and when they do, it changes everything about them. All of them that day, where they left their boats, they dropped everything, they began to follow Jesus. He said, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And I love it so much how Jesus gives them purpose. He gives them purpose. He said, from now on, what you do will be done on purpose. You're not just fishing to fish, you're fishing for men. You see, we have this generation that um, really freaks out over the word purpose. They've literally given it a, a title of purpose anxiety. They say that most of us struggle with purpose anxiety. We get so freaked out by thinking about our purpose that it makes us anxious. What is our purpose? Do we have a purpose? And I just wanna say to you, I believe that whenever your life with Jesus becomes personal, you won't be confused about your purpose. It won't give you anxiety to think about. You're not gonna be confused, you're gonna know. You're gonna know what your purpose is. Because your purpose just becomes what you do for the glory of God. So if you're a nurse, love God and love those people in the hospital and point people to the glory of God. If you're a teacher, love God and love those students and somehow point them into the revelation of the glory of God. If you're an athlete, look at Tim. Love God, love the athletes around you and point people to the glory of God. What are you, what do you do, what do you get to do? Do you fish, fish for men. My husband works out. I can't even tell you how many times he comes home and he goes, hey, I'm going to lunch with somebody tomorrow that just met at the gym. He's baptized people that he asked to help spot him in the gym. I love it. Like that's, that's what it looks like to walk out purpose. That's what it looks like when your life, all of a sudden, everything about it has meaning. And Jesus will give you that, friend. So don't leave here and separate the two any longer. I have three questions that I wanna leave you with. And I want you to write them down if you have a notebook or even if you have your phone, don't get distracted, go to the notes in your phone. And I really want you to sit with these three questions for a second because I think if you can answer these clearly, then I believe that your personal life and your spiritual life will be one and the same. I believe that you can look at it throughout the year and you can make sure that you're bringing Jesus into everything that you're doing. So we're gonna have these questions on the screen. The first one, what is your boat? Where are your everyday moments in life spent? So go ahead and write that down and answer it. Where are your everyday moments in life spent? Be super practical, is it the gym? Name the gym you go to. Name the coffee shop that you go to. Name the apartment that you live in, the sorority house you're gonna be in, the fraternity house. Put your address. What's your boat? And if you wanna write it below or just say it in your heart, just Jesus, I invite you into that. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're in me. So wherever I am, you are. Give me eyes to see how I can bring you glory in that space. Maybe it's intramural sports. I mean, it can literally be anything. Next question. What are your fish? What job position are you in or what are the hobbies that you love to do and are gifted in? This can also be anything. It can be art, social media, it can be hunting, it's probably what my dad would put. It's a lot. What are your hobbies? doesn't have to sound spiritual, it's just what God put in you and that in and of itself is spiritual. What a gift. He designed you in such a way that you love to do that, that you're good at doing that. Now ask God, how can I use this for your glory? Why do you put this in me? How can I do this on purpose? 
Last question. What is your net? Now this is a harder one to answer. This is gonna be the one that might be hard to do. And it says, what is the thing or the areas in your life that you need to surrender to God? What are some of the areas that you've been saying, I got this side of it, God? The areas you just haven't invited him into because you're kind of scared of what he might say. Maybe it's the relationship. Maybe it's your major. You know the answer to that one. Write it down. Because if you can surrender that, my gosh, you're gonna be blown away by the spaces that God takes you into. I love Christine said, what is the promise without the presence? What is it? You know, we just want your presence, God. We'd rather have your purpose over our plan, God.